There's a, a writer named Francis Chan. He wrote a book called The Forgotten God, revealing our tragic effect of the Holy Spirit. And here's one thing that he wrote. He said, from my perspective, the Holy Spirit is tragically neglected and for all practical, practical purposes forgotten. While no evangelical would deny his existence, there are millions of church workers across America who cannot confidently say that they have experienced his presence or action in their lives in the past year. And many of them do not believe that they can. That's sad, isn't it? You have a word. We can try to learn to have that Holy Spirit. Another pastor, he's a pastor of the Summit Church in, uh, uh, somewhere in North Carolina. His name is J.D. Greer. And he believes that evangelicals fall into one of two extremes. The first one, someone seems so obsessed with the Holy Spirit, relating to him in, in strange, mystical ways, their experience with the Spirit seems to coincide with, with an emotional and ecstatic moment. That's where you go into a church and you hear the speaking in tongues and everybody gets excited and they're jumping up and down the pew doing an aisle. In fact, a lot of those churches believe you're not drunk to a stage in this you have received the Holy Spirit. And when we, you were, I'm sorry, I meant to correct myself there. They believe that you're not a true Christian unless you speak in tongues, in tongues. Which I've never seen that in scripture. The second one is other Christians react to that perceived excess by neglecting his ministry altogether. They believe in the Holy Spirit, but they relate to him in the same way they might relate to their pituitary plan. You know, we all have one. We're grateful we have it, but we have no idea what it's there for. And the Holy Spirit can be the same way sometimes. And really, you know, if you look at that, you kind of fall in that second category. We know that there's a Holy Spirit. We're grateful that's there, but we don't know how to use it. There's no doubt that the Holy Spirit is by far the most misunderstood of the Trinity. And all of that, but he's also ignored. Now, I know I can't just want to go through everything about the Holy Spirit. But what we're going to be in, the book we're going to be in today is in the book of John. And we're going to be looking at some scripture in, in chapters 14, 15, and 16. And we're going to look at many four passages that I hope will help us understand on how we can engage with the Holy Spirit. But we need to learn about the person of the Holy Spirit. We need to know about him. We need to know what kind of power he actually holds for us. So here's a brief background to put things into context. Jesus has just announced to his disciples that he's leaving. His disciples are distraught. They don't know what to think. Jesus just told them that he's leaving. No, they're extremely unsettled to think about this. And so in these three chapters here, we're going to see how Jesus attempted to make us feel better about his leaving. But before we get into it, I want to draw your attention to one word, and that's helper. You're going to hear that word several times this morning, helper, as it describes the Holy Spirit. So the passage, the four passages I'm really going to be working with today is John chapter 14, verse 16. And then chapter 14, verse 26, and we'll jump to chapter 15 and look at verse 26 there. And finally at chapter 16, verse 7. Now, helper, what does helper mean? Helper is somebody that can come forward and then somebody at hand. No, so they can be a representative for you. No, the one that follows alongside of you to help you out with something. You know, in the Bible, helper is described like this. Comforter, counselor, encourager, advisor, pleader, proxy, and advocate. So let's start with John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. 
that he may abide in you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I want you to take a look at something here. In the script that we just read, it involves the entire Trinity. Jesus asked the Father to send a helper. So you see all three of them there. And a the helper is also called the Spirit of Truth. Now I know how God is how God is described in another Baptist article of faith, and I wrote really, I love the way they word it. Is it this? That in the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Equal in divine perfection and executing distinct but harmonious opposites in the great work of redemption. Amen. I think that says it very well. They're all equal, they just got different jobs to do. Now the word another is also in the scripture. It means one of the same kind or one of of people quality. The idea is sameness. Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit will be like himself. And the Holy Spirit will take his place. The helper will be with us forever. You know, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is mentioned, I think, about 100 times. But in the Old Testament, God would send the Holy Spirit to somebody to perform a task that God's given them. And when they were done with that task, God took the Holy Spirit off of them. I think that's why King David, he prayed in Psalm 51 11, where he says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. King David says, After God, don't take the Spirit away. Don't take the Holy Spirit. Because he knew the Holy Spirit was just temporary in those definitions. In John 14, 18, Jesus said this, I will not leave you that orphan. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Those who don't know Christ cannot know the Holy Spirit. Those who do not know Christ cannot be in doubt with the Holy Spirit. Believers, now that we as believers, we know him. Now we need to realize that he is a person and he comes to us personally. He just knocks on a mystical force like the ear of Star Wars, no, a mystical force to reach you. That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. He's not some kind of power or experience. The Holy Spirit is a person, just like the Father and the Son are. A person. The Holy Spirit is also a he and not a it. The Bible uses masculine pronouns, he and him, to refer to the Holy Spirit. He is not an it, he is a he. The Holy Spirit only dwells with us. So right now, every one of us in here that is a believer, we are endowed with the Holy Spirit. I like the way one pastor said it one time. He said, he has always been a God who is close to presence, but only since Jesus returned to heaven has he taken up presence inside us. And that makes him closer than ever. Again, John chapter 40, verse 26, it says, with the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance of the things that I have said to you. Notice again, the Trinity is mentioned here in the, in the scripture. The Father sent the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. The Trinity is involved in everything. Everything in our life, the whole of the Trinity is involved. Amen. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to teach us. As believers, he is here to teach us. He only has one textbook, and that's the Bible. And when we study the Bible, we need to be studying the Bible with the Holy Spirit. Or we need to be asked for the Holy Spirit's guidance as we study the Scripture. 
He brings the truth to the disciples and all the disciples. He also helps them remember what Jesus said and what Jesus was teaching. The Holy Spirit was so involved in their inspiration of the scriptures. Remember this. The Holy Spirit is involved in every word that's in our Bible. We're taught and we're reminded as we study the Word of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where prophecy never came by the will of man, the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When Paul wrote 60% of the New Testament, he was moved by the Holy Spirit. When all the men that wrote the Old Testament were writing those words down, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now let's take a look at John 15, 26. It says, But when the Helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Once again, we see the Trinity. Jesus will send the Helper, which is the Holy Spirit, who needs who comes from the Father. You know, I didn't write down the word, but even in the first chapter of Genesis, we see the Holy Spirit at work. And it says that the Spirit of God was upon the Jesus. Just like Jesus, the Holy Spirit was here from the beginning. He is the Spirit of truth. You know what? That's something that we so, so many need in this world right now, the Spirit of truth. Because there's so many lies out there in the world right now. The Holy Spirit bears witness about Jesus. That's why the Holy Spirit was sent here by God. Was the witness about Jesus. Now, if you'll notice, the Holy Spirit does not promote himself anywhere in Scripture in the New Testament. He never does. But he does promote Jesus Christ. Like he says in John 16, 14, when Jesus said that, he will glorify me. You remember what Jesus did when he was walking the earth? He glorified the Father. And now we see the Holy Spirit glorifying Christ. In John chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. There is a word, nevertheless, is, is a contrast to what the disciples are feeling. They don't want Christ leaving. They've been with him for three years. They're comfortable with him. They know his teachings. They like hanging out with him. So what he said to them is shocking when he said, it is to your advantage that I go away. Can you imagine being with disciples you're trying to think about what kind of advantage is it that you're leaving? How could it be to their advantage? Or what benefit could it be for Jesus to be gone from them? Jesus tells them why his departure will be possible to them. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Three times Jesus used the word Go and depart. To help the disciples understand that he's about to leave them. He's about to return to heaven. But he has to do that in order for the Holy Spirit to come upon him. Here's a good question to think about. Would you rather have Jesus right next to you, or would you rather have the Holy Spirit within you? I think I'd rather have the Holy Spirit within me. Again, J.D. Greer said, when Jesus was on earth, his miraculous work was contained to wherever he was at that moment. Now that he is in us, his power is wherever we are. The Spirit inside us is better than Jesus beside us. When Jesus was on earth, he was in the flesh. He, he was a mortal man. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. 
He, he could perform miracles where he was at that moment. So is the Holy Spirit in all the all the believers of the world. That means the Holy Spirit can be everywhere at once. Yeah. Working through us. And unlike the Old Testament, we have the assurance that the Holy Spirit will put never be taken away from us. We will never have to worry about him departing. We receive him the moment, the moment we accept Christ, and we have him until the moment we die. The Bible says there's at least two ways the short service of the Holy Spirit will work in our lives. The first one is we can grieve the Holy Spirit. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 30 and 31, it says that do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So we're told there we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm sure all of us have grieved the Holy Spirit at least once every day. We can't help it, we're flesh. But what is grief? That's to make the Holy Spirit sad. And we don't want to do that. Second one is quenching the Holy Spirit. First, first Thessalonians 5 19 tells us this Do not quench the Spirit. To quench means to put out a fire. When we ignore the Holy Spirit by continually compromising our moral morals and our biblical conviction, and we see the fire of the Holy Spirit trying to reduce me to reduce this moment because we sit on doing it our way. I remember I had a friend tell me one time, he wasn't a Christian, but he told me, he said, No, at my funeral, I want to play the song I did my way. I would hope there's not a Christian in the world that would want that song played at their funeral. We, we want a song that says we did it God's way. We've learned about the Holy Spirit, now we must live by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Living in the Spirit is not enough. We must Everything we do, everything we say, must be from the Holy Spirit. And as we yield to the Spirit, we will experience His power. You know what? People will notice it. People will see it. Again, Francis Chan writes this. I don't want my life to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. I want people to look at my life and know that I couldn't be doing this by my own power. There are problems we try to do it in our own power. We need to let the Holy Spirit do it in His power. So we, one thing we need to do, we need to make sure we stay in step with the Holy Spirit. Now I think about this, staying in step with the Holy Spirit. I remember basic training. And there might be two or three thousand men out there on the parade grounds. And every group of men, about 40 or 50 men, are in a different position in their march because they're all out there practicing. And in that chaos comes order. You cannot move a group of men from one point to another and just say, follow me, and come on, and it happens. It'll fit, you'll fit to get there, but it's going to look like a mess. I remember we'd be in formation and I remember when the Bill Murphy Gorge and March, we all step off to the left foot at the same time. And of course, we call pages to make sure we stay the step. But the order that we were in when we first started is the same order we were in when we arrived at where we were going. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. We must maintain that step of the Holy Spirit. First, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's so easy for us to fill ourselves up with the things of the world. Ephesians 5.18 says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a command that's really telling us that we are to keep ourselves filled with the Holy Spirit at all times. If we keep ourselves filled with the Holy Spirit, there's not room 
the three things now tied to him. We need to keep being filled. Charles Spurgeon, whenever he was reading a sermon, he was walking up the steps of the pulpit. For every step he could take, he would say these words, I believe in the Holy Spirit. With every step he took, he said that. We need to do the same thing. We need to always be saying that we believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, I hear a lot of times people say the Holy Ghost. Nowhere in Scripture does it say it's the Holy Ghost in the original languages. It doesn't. When I think of my hear ghost, I think of Casper. Little white guy pulling through walls and, you know, having fun on Saturday mornings. But, what we, but the part of the trend that we're talking about today is the Holy Spirit. He's not a ghost. We all need to be purified by the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit should have a purifying effect on our lives. Before, before Christ came, God's Spirit dwelt in the tabernacle. But now, the Holy Spirit dwells within God's people, which is the church. We are now the temple of God. And remember, the Holy Spirit is God. God displays His beauty and glory today to believers, and as such, we must treat our bodies carefully to make sure that they are dedicated to His purpose. Our bodies are a temple. I guarantee you one thing. I'm almost six foot two, and I weigh a few pounds. The Holy Spirit has a lot of room. I want to make sure He's comfortable. This spelled out real clearly in verse 3 in chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, where it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is within you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We gotta remember. This belongs to God. When we accept Christ our Savior and we're endowed with the Holy Spirit, we belong to God. God also dwells within the church. In 1 Corinthians 3 16, it says this Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Everybody that accepted Christ our Savior today, that's sitting here in this church right now, you're endowed with the Holy Spirit. You're a part of the temple of God. Is no longer a temple made with human hands. Again, to quote Francis Chan, he said, If it's true that the Spirit of God dwells in us and that our bodies are the Holy Spirit's temple, then shouldn't there be a huge difference between the person who has the Spirit of God living inside of him or her and the person who does not? Shouldn't we look different to the world? Should the world be able to look at us and think that person has something? And we should be living in a way that whatever it is we have, we should the Spirit within us that they would want it too. We need to be serving according to our spiritual gifts that come from the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ our Savior, we are given a gift from God. Sometimes we got to do a lot of prayer, a lot of search. To find out what this gift is that God has given us. But we all have a gift. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, If each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, you have a job. God has given you a gift to be used for the furthering of the kingdom. Next, we need to. Demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. Those things that should not be in us are found in Galatians chapter, nine, chapter 5, verse 19 and 21, where it says, These are not going to be in us, okay? Sexual immorality, impurity, mockery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envies. 
When we look at Galatians 5, 23, we see that the fruit of the Spirit that's supposed to, that is supposed to be in us. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know, one of the, when it comes to Christians, one of the hardest things that we deal with sometimes is envy. I don't know how many times I've sat down and talked to somebody, and they say, I wish I had a gift like they had. I wish I could do what they do. Not realize that God has an important job for them already. We sometimes we envy what somebody else does. That is not helpful in the kingdom of God. We all have a special gift. Trust me, you'll not see me still sing like Christian does. That's why God called me to preach not to sing. Because you wouldn't want me to leave the sing up there. I would make John sound good. <laughs> I got a big money, John. We also should pray in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 6 18 says, Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. First of all, we're to pray in the Holy Spirit. And we're also to pray for our fellow Christians, which is the saints. We should always pray for each other. A few, a few Sundays ago, I preached on, on prayer. Jesus prayed for everybody but himself. First, he prayed for himself. Then he prayed for the disciples. Then he prayed for the church. And that's why we should pray. First, we pray for ourselves. Ask forgiveness of our sins. Then we pray for other people. Then we need to pray for the church body as a whole. To pray the Spirit means to follow, also means to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we pray with the Holy Spirit, we're praying in His power, not ours. We need to go with the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's fascinating to me that Jesus held His disciples back from witnessing until they had the Holy Spirit. You remember what He said to them? In Luke 24. Verses 40 and 49 says, And you are a witness, you do our witness of these things. Behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endowed with the power from on high. He told them not to witness until they received the Holy Spirit. And trust me, when they received that Holy Spirit, they shook the world. Now when we read the book of Acts, we see where there are thousands coming to the church daily. Will that be something to see in our country now where we can see thousands coming to Christ? When we proclaim Christ, we do so with the power of the Holy Spirit in us. No, we always seem to have a, a good plan. But sometimes when we make our plan, we, we forget to involve God in any way in that plan. I'm sure we've all done this. I'm sure I'm guilty of it too. We're having trouble in our life. We, we get down on our knees, we pray to God for help, and then we try to explain to Him how God needs to fix it. We're well, not God to do it His way. I guarantee you, His way is a whole lot better than our way. I want to talk about two different groups of people. And I'm sure we got some of these groups in here this morning. The first one is Christians who need to surrender. If you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit, but here's a question for you. Does the Holy Spirit have all of you? You have all the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit have all of you? Have you been living in your own life or do you always and do you always need that? Your ways are right. No, you've been saved by grace, but now you're trying to do everything on your own. Paul addressed this in Galatians 3 3. 
who says, are you so foolish? That's a poor, tough word right there, isn't it? To start this verse, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? We try to perfect ourselves by the flesh, don't we? We need to be perfecting ourselves by the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we need to surrender everything to Him. Not sometime in the future, but now. The second group is non Christians who need to get saved. If you're not saved, you're in a very dangerous position. There will be a final exam one day, and God does not grade on the curve. Either you accepted Christ or you haven't. People tell me sometimes, well, I just haven't decided to walk with you yet. And I actually told the guys one time, well, I said, well, you've already decided then. You've decided you're okay with going to hell. Every time we're in the church, we get a surprise and an invitation is starts. And you don't make up your mind about whether I'm accept Christ or not, you've accepted, you've already made up your mind that you've done it. We need to remember the scripture tells us real clear we're not promised tomorrow. We're only promised today. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is doing right now in this world. In John 6, chapter 16, verse 8 to 11, it said, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is convicting the world right now. He wants to convict everybody of salvation, but unfortunately, most of the world will say no. Concerning sin, Jesus said, Because they did not believe in me. So you need first to admit that you're a sinner. According to this verse, the biggest sin is not to believe in Christ. That's what's called blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, when the Holy Spirit goes to a person and convicts them of their sin, that you need to accept Christ as Savior, if you reject that call from the Holy Spirit, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You don't believe anything about righteousness. He said, God, I go to the Father. Jesus is our standard for righteousness. So, you all have to admit that you are unrighteous. We don't like it when we're wrong about anything, do we? And then concerning judgments, because the rule of the world is judged. Please stand with me as we have our invitation.